I've, I wrote this book because of an obsession with the Congo. The Congo is an awesome place. It really gets into your mind, gets into your heart, and it really boils down to, it's more than a love affair. It's an obsession. I find the Congo the most tantalizing story, the most tantalizing human drama on the planet, not just in Africa. You know, this is a place where today 1,500 souls perish every day, 1,500 souls. Tim Butcher is journalist for the Daily Telegraph and deed de afgelopen jaren verslag van alle grote conflict- en oorlogsgebieden, zoals Irak, Afghanistan en Sierra Leone. Hij schreef het boek Bloedrivier over de tocht die hij in 2000 ondernam door het Afrikaanse Congo. Is that I went to Africa to cover as a reporter for the Daily Telegraph. I went in the year 2000 and I found something I didn't know, which is that the Congo's history changes because of a Daily Telegraph journalist who sent that, Henry Morton Stanley, the explorer, the Victorian explorer. He describes himself as an explorer, but he was in fact a journalist on this trip. He was sent by the Telegraph. So it was like a personal connection. And so and to find out where the Africa's, Africa's problems come from today, I was going to go back to where it had all begun. I was going to do this journey, the journey that Stanley did, his journey of discovery. And for me, I was going to see if it was going to be my own sort of journey of discovery to try and understand where the modern problems of the Congo come from. Many people said it was impossible to do, and several people told me it was suicidal to attempt this journey. This is an area riven by war, 1,500 souls dying a day. So we have war that'll kill you, but the other thing that'll kill you is disease. We're talking about an area with very little health care, so you have to keep yourself well, and if you don't, you, there's no one's going to make you better again. And also the sheer scale of this place. You know, we're talking about a place which is, from one side to the other, is the distance from London to Moscow. You know, it's a huge, huge area, and there are barely any roads left, no railways, no infrastructure. So that was the challenge. One of the great themes of, of, of this book and my, my journey is, is, is seeing this evidence of, of, of a civilization that tried to establish itself in Africa on a big scale. I mean, the Belgians were very ambitious. They thought they'd conquered the river and put a navigable channel in and navigation lights and railways and roads. And, you know, this will always be there. It's an amazing lesson in humility to go to the Congo today. Because unless you maintain infrastructure and you're prepared to put in the effort, infrastructure means nothing. And it's a wonderful lesson for us in our sort of developed world. We assume that everything's going to be, be like this. But you know, what, you, what you see if you go to the Congo today is like a post-apocalyptic vision of what might be for the rest of the world if there was a you know, climate change and there was another ice age or a tsunami or a, or a nuclear attack or something. Because you go there and you see... All of these things built by engineers and planners who thought that you know, it made sense to have a bridge over this uh, river in, the, in, in, in eastern Congo. It was a big box girder bridge, and the girders are made in Belgium, and they're shipped out there and dragged across the jungle. And the bridge is there, and it's there today, and I kind of came across these bridges. But there's no cars to go across it, and it's just like a little trail that comes to it. And you come to it, it's like a folly. It's like a folly, and it's like evidence of man's folly that they thought 30-ton bridge because there'll always be lorries to cross here. In the Congo, that's not the case. The lorries have gone. The conclusion would be that through history, the Congo has suffered a whole series, a great litany of missed opportunities from the time that Stanley arrives, through the colonial period, through the uh, Leopold II period, and through the post-colonial period. It has been cursed with missed opportunities. This, the potential of this place is so huge. It should be the place where you and I routinely go on holiday and you and I invest, or Westerners invest money and everyone. It should be part of the modern world. So my conclusion is that um, a whole bunch, a bunch of missed opportunities. Does that mean it is forever doomed? No, because the vast majority of people in the Congo are not these corrupt, violent, psychopathic, insensitive thugs who get onto our television screens because you know, that running around rebellion rebels looks good and looks it is, it is dramatic. They're just a tiny, tiny minority. The vast majority of the people who I saw, and I didn't name him, but there was an, uh, I described and, and named him in the book. There's a guy who who is so willing to just try and earn some money that he's prepared to walk for 800 kilometers, 400 kilometers one way and 400 the other in the forest to, to make a trade, to trade. He's dragging palm oil on an old bicycle through the forest for 800 k's and then back again. Maybe he'll make $30 if he's lucky. And that was a real inspiration. He wasn't the only one I saw. I mean, I saw thousands of these people. And it was almost as if the heart of a country, it's People have tried to kill it, they tried to choke it, but it's just beating faintly. And he's a little blood, blood cell coursing down one of the blood vessels. It's beating faintly, but I'm confident that, that it'll get there. And the name, the, the river, the name Blood River is a deliberate double play. It's a double play because, yes, it, this is a place associated with violence. And yes, the river has run red with blood on many occasions. 
but also it's a river that can bring life, a blood river. It's an artery, uh, a blood vessel. 